Welcome to Zimmerman Podcast, episode 96. Guess who's back? It's Kelsey Murphy. Kelsey is a present mom, a boundaried businesswoman, and an incredible career and life coach to women everywhere. If you listen to episode 64, you know that Kelsey and I are total soul sisters, and I could not be more excited to share more of Kelsey and her wisdom with you today. I somehow love this episode even more than the last one, if that's possible. Kelsey is sharing why being a mom and working isn't an either or scenario, how to let your yeses be yeses and your noes be hell noes, and what it looks like to turn a side hustle into a full-time business. All right, you ready? Let's do it. I'm Jessica Zimmerman, and this is Zimmerman Podcast. I'm a serial entrepreneur, mom to three, and professional oversharer who has spent a decade building my business and helping others do the same. From wedding floral design to business education, features in Martha Stewart Weddings and Forbes magazine, and even writing and publishing my best selling memoir, Sleeping with a Stranger, my business has kept growing, evolving, and changing year after year, just like me. Because the best thing about building a strong business is the freedom it gives me to live a full life. And that's what Zimmerman Podcast is all about, sharing real, transparent, in-the-moment reflections about how to live a life, build a business, and lead a family through the good, the hard, and the messy. That's what we're doing each week right here on Zimmerman Podcast. Welcome to the show. Kelsey, thank you so much for coming back on the podcast. I'm so excited to have you back. Oh, thanks for having me. I love I love chatting with you. This is going to be fun. Okay, so Zimmerman Podcast listeners, if you haven't heard the first episode with Kelsey, go listen to that right now. You can go to the show notes and see which episode that is. We had such a great time talking about how to connect with heroes in your industry in in a non-gross way and (laughs) what it looks like to build an online presence that helps you connect and build your business. Today, we're talking about how to transition from side hustle to full-time business and how to build a business that fits into the life you want to live. So let's dive in. Okay, Kelsey, let's talk about what it looked like for you when you first started your business. How long were you balancing a full-time job and starting your business as a side gig? Oh, it's such a good question. And and as you know, I like to be extremely open and transparent. I feel like that really helps people to understand. Like, is Those this are my or- favorite kind of guests. Those are the <laughs> only people we want to listen to are the really honest ones. <laughs> right? I'm like, there is no question off limits here. Um, no. So when I first started, um, I there was no lightning bolt. There was no like, oh, this is what I have to do. I know it. I knew it from day one. Um, it was definitely a journey of like self-exploration. And when I started to get kind of the inkling that I wanted to do something different, I was in my corporate job. I was working crazy hours. And for those of you who have listened to the podcast before, you'll hear a bit of that story. But I used to be the average advertising director for Nintendo and Elizabeth Arden and GoPro. And I mean, there was like one day where I was fielding calls from Paris and Seattle and Japan, like and New York, all in a 24 hour period. It was so, so crazy and so fun. I mean, I, I was doing these incredible projects. I was like shooting commercials with like Britney Spears and Bono. And and trust me, on paper, it was very fancy. Like at the bars, I had lots of fun things to talk about, but I was very burnt out. And and I definitely did not feel like this was my like I'm doing air quotes calling or purpose, right? Like, and I had. Come kind of just acquiesced to the fact that like, well, no one really likes their job, right? Or like no one really has like a purpose except for those few exceptions out in the world. And those are just the people that wake up in the morning or they come out of the womb and they know like, I'm going to start a bakery or I'm meant to bake cupcakes or, you know, like these people that have these passions. And I just thought, oh, that's just not me, right? But what I realized was I had just 
kind of buried myself in this job, um, not in a bad way, but in a way that I was learning. I was learning what it was like to do the advertising world. I was learning what it was like to have a corporate job, to, to be successful. I was starting to make really good money. So I was learning what that felt like. And I was going through these different iterations of my life and um, learning more things about myself. And I, I continuously had these gut feelings that this is not exactly right. But I would kind of shove it to the side because I would be like, no, keep going, like keep the security, keep the paycheck. You know, I would focus on all the good at my corporate job until like you just know, like you start to get pushed over the edge and there's less pleasurable things and then there are painful things, right? Like it just starts to feel more and more painful. And that's when I started to get burnt out. And really what happened was I, I stopped showing up kind of with my whole heart to my job. And I could tell that I was feeling guilty and like a little bit more disappointed in myself. And I was kind of beating myself up. And that's where I was like, okay, Kelsey, you need to make a decision. Like, are you going to start trying to figure out what this next step is? Are you just going to keep kind of like mailing it into this job and feeling guilty for it? Because that's not who you are. And so I started to dabble, quote unquote, dabble in things, right? I literally went, I, I thought I was going to be a marriage and family therapist. I thought I was going to be a massage therapist. Like I literally was at like massage therapy school orientation, sitting in there looking around being like, this is it. This is a job for me. Like I have found it. And then they started to explain the schedule and I realized I was going to have to touch other people's bodies. And I was like, I, I don't think this is a job for me. <laughs> like Something about this doesn't feel right. And, and I, I looked into going back to business school. I looked into so many different things and I went and shadowed different people at jobs. And I, and I just committed to exploring and testing things out in an actionable way, right? Like that was really important to me because there's a difference between when you're thinking about it and you're living in your head because then you're just living in this really gray area of limbo. And it's almost like your confidence continues to deteriorate because you're not being decisive. You're not taking any action. And you start to think the only action I can take is just to quit my job and kind of like jump off this cliff when that's not the case. Like the action you can take is to show up at massage school orientation if you think that that might be it. Because once you get there and you decide this is a yes or a no, your confidence comes back because you remember, oh, I can be decisive. Oh, I can make decisions. But you do have to take some actions first. So I started being really actionable about my exploration. And then I ended up going to this like free coaching seminar for a day. I was actually, my husband and I were traveling and we were out in London and I had never been to London before. And it's one of his favorite towns. And, and we were just like so excited to go there and have been talking about it for months and months and months. And the day before we go, I find this like janky, like free coaching seminar online that's going to be in this like weird area of town. And I'm like, hey, I think. I want to go to this. And he just looks at me and is like, are you for real? Like we have <laughs> tours booked, like we have friends we're meeting at pubs, like what are you talking about? And I'm like, I don't know, but I just feel like this seems really interesting. You know, maybe it's happening for a reason. I don't know. There's just like this weird thing inside of me that's saying you should go. And I've committed to being on this journey of exploring what my next steps are. And he was like, okay, you're crazy, but go for it. Like, I will be on the big red bus. Like, you go to this weird hotel like, and go to your coach, weird coaching seminar. And I, and I went. And this is, you know, one of the many routes that I was exploring. And when I walked in there and when they started talking about coaching and the human psychology behind it and how our values and beliefs um, play this role in operating like our our internal system and our external system, I was instantly like, this is it. Like, this is so important to how we show up in the world. And why are we not teaching this in schools? Why are we not understanding this more? And that feeling of being like, I don't know what the future looks like. I don't know what the business looks like, but I know that this something about this feels so right for me. It's like, that was my mini lightning bolt, you know? And that's when I was like, okay, now I can make the decision that exploring a business in this vein is what I need to do next. And then 
that's when I went on like the journey of like, okay, now what is like a coaching business look like? What kind of coach do I want to be? Like, how is that going to like look as I, as I now leave and, and pivot out of this, this corporate job. And even that journey, what then took another year or two of exploring what kind of coach I wanted to be, exploring what I wanted my business model to look like. Did I want to do one-on-ones? Did I want to do masterminds? Did I want to do online courses? You know, I would say it probably wasn't till two, about two years into that, till I was making the same kind of, you know, really good money that I was making in my corporate job. And because that was important to me, I wasn't going to be able to just leave and, you know, do a business where I was making like, you know, peanuts. Like for me, it's always been important to be financially independent. So I wanted to create a business where I could work kind of part-time hours, to be honest, because I wanted to be available to my kids and I wanted to be so, you know, present for them, show up at the field trips, drop them off, pick them up. Like that was key for me. But I also wanted to be making at least the amount I was making in my corporate job, if not more. And so until I got to that point, it's probably about two years. And so throughout that two years, I did my coaching business, but I would also, I, I think I picked up two freelance jobs for like a few months. Like, so each freelance job was like two to three months and I would work two to three months for that freelance job to just get enough cash in to sustain me with a combination of that cash plus my coaching business for like the next year. And I probably did that for two years until then I kind of was off to the races. And I feel like when you hit that spot where you are making what you made, like in your corporate job, you are usually shocked at how much you've learned in your business and how much more than you can make because you are like 10 times more educated, you know? Yeah. Oh gosh. There's so much wisdom in all of that. That is so good. Okay. There's three things that you said that I want to expand on. (laughs) I love it. Okay. So the first thing is uh, about the job you're in. So I know, you know, that that there are people listening right now who whatever job they're in, they don't like it. They're not enjoying it. They don't feel like it's their calling. They know what they want to do, but they just can't get there yet. And I want to share with you about before I bought a Southern tradition, which was the wedding business that I bought, which was before I turned it into Zimmerman events, I worked at a kitchen store. We've talked about this before. And I learned so much in that experience. I learned not only the kind of boss I wanted to be one day, but I learned the kind of boss I didn't want to be. Listen, I have a lot of respect for the way that people run their businesses. And we and you and I talked about this on on the last time you were on, but you know, we're going to attract and we're going to repel people. And I think if you're building a business, you know, you definitely want to attract your kind of people. Um because it's really hard to work with people that that you don't, you know, get along with or that you don't see things the same. And I think oftentimes that's what's so hard about a business that we don't own ourselves. That's that's one of the best things about owning my own business is I get to hand pick you know, who I work with. And if it's not a good fit, then we can say goodbye. And you you don't have that control, you know, when someone else uh, is responsible for the hiring and the firing. But what I learned was the kind of boss that I wanted to be because I learned a lot of things that I didn't want to be as a boss. And I don't think I would have gotten that clarity, you know, had I not experienced it. And so I think sometimes we do have to go through some some things. We do have to experience some things in order to get clarity for how we want to be in the future. Does that make sense? Oh, yes, 100%. And and I can like, I could reminisce with you till the cows come home about that, because I feel like um, usually when you're in it, it's very, very hard to recognize that that's what's happening. Like you, you just, you want a decisive path forward. You want a clean, clear answer, right? And a lot of times when you're in that exploration phase or when you're in that part of the journey, um, you you don't have that clear answer. You don't have that clear path forward. But recognizing and hearing from like your story and my story that truly you are learning the things that you need 
for the next phase. Like you are being prepared, like you are surrounded by things that are helping you to figure out what your calling is, what your purpose is, what your strengths are, what you love and what you don't love, what you want to incorporate in your life and your business and what you don't. Like every single second, like there's an opportunity to learn those things. And so I love that you're calling that out because that is very hard to see when you are in that moment. It, it is, but it's also, you know, I do believe that preparation plus opportunity is what equals success. And we are not going to get the opportunity until we're prepared. And that's part of the preparation, whether we like it or not. It just is. I mean, how else, how else would I know that I want to be the type of employee who remembers people's birthdays, sends a little gift on their birthday or their anniversary, or just remembers, you know, once every couple months to say, hey, that you're doing an awesome job. I don't know if I've said that to you lately, but you really are. Um, you know, I don't know, unless I had had an experience where a boss said to me, listen, I'm not going to say I appreciate you and thank you for your work. Your paycheck is your appreciation. You know what I mean? Unless right. I had had that experience, I might have been the same way. And so I think that, you know, it's just important. And you just try to look at everything as a learning experience in one way or, or, or another, just to reframe it in that way. The second thing that I wanted to say is, okay, so here's my opinion on passions. And here's what I think. And I can talk to you about this because you're also a mom. You have a three-year-old and a three-month-old. Here's what I think one of my biggest responsibilities as a mom is. I believe that we're all born with, you know, uh, gifts. Like these are these are our talents. These are woven into our DNA. These are our strengths. And I think as a young, young, young child, a toddler, we are very clear about what those strengths are and what our interests are. What happens is once we start going to school, you know, maybe someone puts down the thing that we love and we stop doing it. My responsibility is to watch my children and to see, okay, Stella, she loves art. She loves art. I mean, that girl, we have a freaking gallery in our home because she has, she paints so much art and she's drawing pictures and she's color. She loves every type of material. I mean, I'm talking chalk, crayon, colored pencil, marker, paint. I mean, everything. If you can, if you can make something with it, she's doing it. My son, Perry is obsessed with building things, whether it is, it is Lincoln logs or Legos or those magnets. It's all he wants to do is build things. Um, my son Zeke is very inquisitive and he's very all about the facts. You know, he's, he, he knows all these things about dinosaurs. He knows all these things about the solar system. I mean, the kid, he loves to read. And so, if at some point he stops telling me, you know, uh, what what really are kind of uninteresting facts, but I mean, he loves them. So, I mean, if at some point he stops telling me about gravity or the solar system or about dinosaurs, I'm going to know something's up, that somebody told him that that's weird or something. And listen, it's uninteresting to me, but it's, uh, it's interesting to me because he finds it so interesting, which I do love that. I love anybody who's, who's, Un, you know, they're, they're not ashamed of their passion or their or their their love for something. Um, so that I love. Now I can only talk, hear so much about the solar system, but I mean, my and my son Perry, if he stops building, or my daughter, you know, if she all of a sudden stops drawing, I'm gonna just inquire about that. Hey, I noticed you're not drawing as much. Did, what did something happen? Did someone, you know, say something to you? Because what we start to do is we start to bury it. And then what happens is once we're 18 and we're told, well, you have to pick what you want to do in the world. What, do, what are you going to do to, to, to make an income and to build a life for yourself? We're like, I don't know. And we don't have any passion. I don't have a passion. All these people have passion. I don't have passion. And I just don't believe that to be true. I just think that we have suppressed it. And so I think that my biggest job as, or not my biggest, but I think one of my biggest responsibilities as a mom is to really pay attention in these young years. What are they into that they are naturally into, you know? Oh my gosh. I love that so much. And you know what? I, I think that we get in that same habit when we're in a corporate job and, and I have nothing against corporate jobs. I actually think they're beautiful, wonderful, and create these incredible environments. Um, if you're in the right one and working with the right people, but 
sometimes because we're working for someone else and we're working based off of what they need and want us to do, and we're getting rewarded and praised and affirmed based off their to-do list, we shove our to-do list to the side. And our to-do list often can be filled with passions, right? Oh, I wanted to sign up for that Italian class, or, oh, I wanted to go join intramural soccer. You know, I I wanted to do these things, but I'm going to shove those to the side because they're not as important as getting my to-do list done for my boss and getting that raise and moving forward in this because we start to program ourselves to recognize that money is really important, you know, and we probably go through experiences in our life where we see the downfalls of not having money, you know, and we get really scared. And all of a sudden, as we get older, we have these life experiences that are teaching us to focus on success, focus on on money. And and I'm not saying you shouldn't because they're actually really important pieces to the puzzle, you know, but we start to get solely focused on that and we lose ourselves along the way. And it's like all of a sudden we wake up three years later and you're right, we get in that place where we don't have passions, we don't have hobbies. And it's because we've been shoving them to the side as insignificant, unimportant, silly quote unquote, hobbies that are secondary, right? And I think the reality is, is we then end up in a job we're not happy with, we don't feel fulfilled, we're not confident in ourselves, And that bleeds into the rest of our life. That bleeds into our marriage, that bleeds into the way that we feel in relationships, that bleeds into our ability to wake up in the morning and be excited and feel productive. And so this idea of going out and uh, reigniting, you know, what you loved, what you loved as a kid, like re-stimulating that, like we're in charge of that. And that may be very different than what you like to do as a kid, but most likely, especially like if your daughter is giving up painting and drawing, as long as she's still creating in some sort of way, you know, like if she is like, yeah, like, I don't know, I think that colored pencils, I'm, I'm not into it anymore. Like maybe she just outgrows it. But if she's like, I'm, I'm, into this other piece of creation or creativity, right? It's like, then you know, oh, okay, cool. So you've evolved and you're learning who you are in this stage of your life, but you're still making time for that and you're still following that and that's going to fuel you internally. I think as adults, we kind of like skip over many, many years and then we tap into it and we're like, well, yeah, I really used to draw, like to draw with colored pencils when I was a kid, but nothing about that seems appealing. It's like, that's okay. But there was a piece of you that loved to be creative, that loved to create, like what at this stage of your life feels exciting to create right now. And that's what you have to tap into and be actionable around. And that's, what's going to like reignite those passions, you know? Right. Totally. Yeah. And it's, it's not to be taken literally. It's just to look at, you know, what is the interest? Yeah. Um, and which I think is, is, yeah, like I said, one of my biggest responsibilities is to make sure, you know, cause that, that doesn't go away that, that, that strength, that interest. Okay. So when I have someone who is going, you know, uh, they're about to leave their full-time gig and they are about to step in to, you know, their own business. The countdown is on, they are leaving that job and they are doing it. They have set the hard deadline and it is approaching. I tell them, You've got to prepare, prepare, prepare. And there's four things that I tell them to do. But one of those things is to get their website completely done. Like it needs to be a winner. Because I really believe that no matter how people find you, whether it's personal referral or through social media or whatever, they are eventually going to land on your website and that your website should really act as a 24 hour a day, seven day a week employee that is answering people's questions and telling people, you know, what, what you do and how they can get a hold of you and everything. So what role does your website play in your business? I know you're a mom with kids and uh, does having a strong online presence save you time, you know, so you can do more work and less time while having a website that's working for you 24 seven? Oh yeah, a hundred percent. I'm I'm gonna lean heavily into that, and I love that that's what you're you're teaching and and telling people because, you know, in this day and age, this is where people are going first, right? The first thing they're gonna do is Google you, and um, when they land on that site what a beautiful opportunity to connect with other humans. Like it's such an amazing opportunity. So for me, having the things on that site that I want to, you know, 
communicate immediately. Like, and we spoke about this in the last uh, episode that we recorded together, but it's really important to me that I connect with someone emotionally first, and then I lead them down the journey of going deeper with me, right? And that emotional piece is who I am. That's my story. I am sharing all the vulnerable things about what happens inside of my house on a personal level, what happens inside of my house on a business level. And that's just my brand, right? Like that's just what I like to do. There are certain elements of that, that when I speak about other people really connect with. And so for me, it's so important to have those different pieces on my site. And then after each one of those pieces, allow someone to go deeper, whether that is, okay, if you're into this, you're going to love this business plan that I have. Okay. If you're into this, you're going to love getting my emails about how I killed my daughter's caterpillars. You know, like if you're into this, you're going to love this next step. So my job is to make my audience's life easier. Like I want to simplify. I want to solve their problems. Like you can do that in so many ways on a website. Like it, it can be working so hard for you while you sleep. And it and it's a pretty easy thing to get up and going, you know. Want to know the first step to booking more clients? You've got to have a website. And not just any website, but a site built to book. If you're just starting your business, you're probably wondering how you can share about your work, gain clients, and start making money. The answer to all of these things is your website. When I first started my business, I didn't have the money to pay a professional brand expert to create the brand you see here today, but I didn't have to. I used the resources I had to invest in my business and create a brand that would attract the type of client I wanted to work with, supported by a website that was built to transform searching brides into lifelong clients. If you want a simple guide to how to create a site that books without having to invest thousands in a branding expert before you're ready, you need a winning website. To learn more, go to ZimmermanPodcast.com slash website. That's ZimmermanPodcast.com slash website. My friend and I were talking the other day about she's been at a corporate job. She had her own business and then um, she had a baby and she was like, you know what? I got this offer. I'm going to take it because it's going to be good. It's going to give me some stability and I'm not going to have to worry about bringing on my own clients. I'll, I'll get a steady paycheck and everything and and I'll do that for a little bit and it'll it'll be good. You know, it, it, we all know what that's like when we try to talk ourselves into something, right? Oh, yeah. Um, But she, you know, but it did sound good. You know, it did. I mean, I listen, I've tried to talk myself into into the into living in Arkansas for years. I'm like, (laughs) the cost of living is 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 low. And so we can travel the world. It's like, okay, but, you know, you're not really supposed to live here. So it's probably time to do something. But, you know, so she takes on this job and, you know, she stayed in it far longer than she really should have. Now looking back, she's like, man, I should have left, you know, a year ago. And she goes, you know, but it's really hard because she said, you know, as a woman, I say things to myself like, okay, well, you you just can't get your feelings hurt like that. This is business. Or you can stick this out. You can do this. Like you can, I mean, don't be so sensitive or, you know, whatever. And the truth is, is that's true. I mean, that is hard. We do say to ourselves, we should be able to do this longer or why are we getting upset or anything? But the truth is, is I think you've got to be in an environment, whether it's a corporate job or your own business or whatever, where your strengths are not only being used because that's that's a big thing that got to be used. I mean, that's why people get miserable in their jobs is because they it feels like work. Because if you're using your, you know, God-given strengths, those gifts that are woven into your DNA, then then it doesn't feel like work. But so not only should your strengths be used, they need to be celebrated or at the very least appreciated. And I think what was happening for my friend is she's got a very unique and incredible set of gifts, but they just weren't appreciated. You know, people wanted her to fit into this box instead of this one. And when you stay in that kind of environment for too long, it just isn't good. And so it's like, how do you 
start to real? How do you start to go? Let me not talk myself into this. Am I talking myself into staying? Or do I really need to stay? Or is this really my gut telling me that I need to go? And how do we differentiate that? Because what ended up happening to her is, you know, it, it got ugly in 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 the business that she was in and it got hurtful. And it's like, man, if 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 she had kind of taken a step back a year ago and said, you know what, no, this isn't, this doesn't feel right then she could have left on her own terms. And you know what I'm saying? So like, how do we, how do we kind of differ? I, I don't know, distinguish maybe between like the, the the angel on one shoulder and the devil on one shoulder, you know, I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's a good question. And, and I, I, I'm i going to try to say this delicately because <laughs> 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 um, I, I'm going to say two things like, if it feels off even a little bit yep it is mm-hmm. like like if it feels off it is and i know it's hard for us to trust ourselves especially when we have been in and out of a job or in and out of that feeling of is this right is this not right we've been going through highs and lows we've been going around in circles it is very hard for us to trust ourselves but i will tell you if something feels off it is and you know to follow that up if it's not a hell yes it's a hell no you know, like that is, that is the way you have to start training yourself to think. And the scary thing about that is that then turns it back on you and you recognize like, you're actually saying like, and this is in relationships, this is in jobs. You're actually saying, well, there's, there's actually something about me that makes this not work, right? Like th- this maybe could work for other people, but I am, you know, kind of lazy or I'm like, if you're talking about a relationship and I know this personally, because I did this for so many of my my relationships before I ended up with my husband, it's you stay in something that's not a hell yes, because you're like, well, I'm kind of difficult. Like, well, I'm, I mean, I'm a little crazy. So like, like I get it. I'm not going to have that perfect partner that, that these other people have. Like, I'm just always going to have a tumultuous relationship, right? Like I am emotional. Like I am a crier. So I'm just always going to have these, these kind of, um, okay relationships. They're not horrible relationships by any means, but they're not like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. How did I ever get so lucky? And that is the kind of marriage you should be in. And that that person is out there. And the same exact thing is, goes for a job. Like I really believe jobs and businesses are the same as finding the one. Uh, you know, what? finding, you know, like it, it is out there. If you are wow. not in that right now, it's just because you haven't found the right one. Like you haven't found the right one. And so if you're feeling that, what I usually recommend people do is instead of just staying in this kind of like woo woo place of like, okay, it's off, but now what do I do? Like, okay. So you're telling me like, if someone's listening they're like, okay, I feel that offness. Like I feel like it's off, but I don't know what to do next. Like the next thing I would do is like, own the situation, like call a spade a spade, and then put some parameters and benchmarks and timeframes on things like be able to say like, maybe in your friend situation, you know, like, or in a situation where there's this really great opportunity that comes up, like you have to call a spade a spade, you can say, this is a great opportunity for these reasons, right? It's going to provide me this amount of money to be financially stable so that I can do this other thing and go find my passion, or it's going to be such an easy job for me that I'll be able to give it a hundred percent for these hours. And then every morning I can spend two hours continuing to look for the job that I really want to do, or I am going to do this, but I'm only going to commit to it for six to nine months. And I will feel really comfortable at that time walking away. This is the kind of conversation I would have. I'm going to write it down. So I remember that that is the role of this job in my life. And I think that when you get really clear about those things, you call spade a spade, then you allow your brain to not feel so guilty about like, you know, like going back into the bad relationship 
relationship. You know, like you recognize at least from a job perspective, like this is going to be a bridge job for me. I'm going to commit to it for X amount of months, for X amount of dollars. And then my job is at the end of six to nine months to have done enough actionable things to be able to hit go on a dream business or a dream job or to know and have the connections that I need to, to make uh, an industry jump or, you know, to step foot into a different kind of a company. Um, That is what I think is really important is that we start in that, that gut internal GPS place. Like if it's off, it is. If it's not a hell yes, it's a hell no. And once you 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 own that, then you you call whatever your situation is, you call a spade a spade and you put some parameters on it. You put a time frame on it, you put a money number on it, whatever you need to to make that like a little bit more tangible and create a plan around that. Oh, yes. Also, can I just say, I've said it before, but I feel like you and I were separated at birth or something because <laughs> I am just everything you say. By the I say call a spade a spade probably 19 times a day. Um, <laughs> so I love it. Okay. So I think, yeah, you've got to stop making excuses. I think you have to do the physical test of how does this make me feel? You know, asking yourself, okay, let me just imagine that tomorrow... I have to go into work. Like, how does your body actually feel? And then asking yourself, okay, if tomorrow I did not have that job, if I did not have the responsibility to go to that job, how do I feel? And I think when your body starts to relax a little bit, you know, I had to do that. I have a building downtown, a big 6,000 square foot building, and I've had it for over 10 years. And I got this feeling last summer that I was supposed to sell it. And I was like, no, I'm not selling it. That's like part of my retirement. I mean, I, you know, I thought I would hang on to it forever. And when I did that exercise, the thought of not owning it anymore felt so freeing, you know, which was able to kind of tell me, okay, so stop with the excuses. Stop with saying you've got to keep it because of this. That's not the only way you're going to make a retirement. You know what I mean? Like, in fact, if you let go of this, you could probably make a bigger retirement doing something else since you don't have to focus on this. And then I think the biggest thing is setting a hard deadline and just being committed to that. Like, it's not about motivation. It's about commitment. And so if you say, you know, June 15th is going to be my last day, it needs to be your last day. Like, stay committed to it. Yeah. And even just putting a timeline on it, like teaching your brain to operate in that kind of a way to be able to be led by your feelings and then not stay in your feelings, right? Like you can't just be like, this is off, but but now what's next? And I'm kind of scared. And like, I don't really know. And uh, you know what? I'm just going to stay here. Like that's what happens, mm-hmm. right? When you stay in your feelings, you're like, oh, well, maybe I could do these things. I'm not really sure. It's like, okay, own your feelings, go there first, a hundred percent, but then get actionable, right? Like you have to go into that actionable place. And the best way to start doing that is like put pen to paper and to say, okay, well, if this is a bridge job, if this isn't my end all be all, what would a plan look like? How much money could I save in the next six months? And what what could I start doing for one hour in the morning to get to the place that I want to be in six months? And what does that date look like? And maybe you set yourself a personal date, like at a spa with a glass of champagne in your journal for three months from now to evaluate how far have I come in three months? Like, what is my progress in three months? You know, um, and when you start putting those like those accountability dates on the calendar, those numbers, like for you, you know, like even the, with the retirement thing, it's like, oh, this is part of my retirement. It's like, what does retirement actually mean? You know, how much money do I need to make? Are there other ways to make that, that feel more exciting and joyful to me? Like you start asking and answering these questions. And again, if you just stay in that kind of like woo woo feeling place, um, you're not going to have put be able to put pen to paper and create a plan and be actionable. But for you, which I'm sure you did, you were like, what does retirement mean to me? Like, what do those numbers look like? And what am I going to use those numbers for? Like, what creates the most happiness for me? And what kind of money do I need for that? And is there other ways for me to create that that feel more exciting? And once you start jotting those things down, you're like, oh, my gosh, there are other futures out there for me that feel way better, that feel way lighter and easier. And and that is the goal, right? To find the job, to find the path that's easy for you, 
but allows you to make the most impact in the world, to be your best self, to show up in a way that you're so proud of, you know? And you know, it's really fascinating for me. A month after I decided, okay, I'm done with the building. I'm going to put it up for sale. When I finally gave into that, a month later, I got the opportunity to write the book and publish the book, mm -hmm. and which felt so much more I'm way, I'm, it's way more natural for me to share vulnerably than it is for me to be a landlord. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, um, and so I think that those opportunities, they're just waiting for you. They're waiting. Like the, what you're supposed to do is waiting for you, but you've got to, you got to be willing to follow it and make some hard choices and really do the work in your inner dwelling, you know, to, to be able to, read what those are, you know? Yeah. And it's like I said in that last podcast that you and I did together, you know, th this is about wholeness and your personal life. I love it because you were talking about this with your, you know, your husband, it, your, your, your marriage should feel this way. Your business should feel this way. That's so true. I mean, your, your marriage should be nurturing or your partnership or your family. However, you know, you spend your personal time, it should be nurturing and the way you spend your business time should be just as nurturing. Mm -hmm. It's all a part of a whole. And so if it isn't nurturing, you really have to kind of ask yourself some hard questions. Okay. So for me, motherhood was a big motivator for creating a business that gave me the flexibility to, you know, prioritize the things that really mattered to me, like my kids, my husband traveling. Did motherhood shape what you wanted your business to look like and how so? Oh, you know what? It did a hundred percent. And as I started to grow into myself and think about getting pregnant and becoming a mom, it shifted dramatically. So I, I grew up in a household of three girls. I, I'm the oldest of three, three little munchkin girls, which I, I understand how intense and complicated that probably was for my parents. Now that I have two little girls, I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like your hands were full. Um, but I grew up in this household where my mom was a stay at home mom and she was just always there for me. Like, and I love her. She's my best friend. Um, and it was this incredible, incredible experience. I mean, she, she nailed it with the stay at home mom thing. And so when I got my job in advertising, honestly, my thought was I'm going to get this really cool job. I'm going to make money and have these experiences. And then I'm going to get married I'm going to have kids and I'm going to stop working like that. That was it. You know, like I want to be a stay at home mom. And when I got together with my, my husband and we started dating, it was like, um, just so you know, I want to be home with the kids. And he was like, what? Like you have the fanciest corporate job that I know. And I'm like, I know. And I'm really glad I was able to do that. But now that we're like, like having heart to hearts, um, I don't want to work. And he was like, wait, what do you mean? And so I realized I was operating in this place of just doing my corporate job just to have fun and as like a short term gig, which, of course, you know, like I, you know, coming from this very small town um, where like I lived on the same street as my extended family and my mom was a stay at home mom. You know, I thought I was going to be married at like 22 and have kids at like 23, <laughs> which I did not. You know, so I ended up being in this corporate job a lot longer than expected and building this career. Career. And what was interesting when I got together with my my husband, he was like, do you really want to be a stay at home mom? Because he's like, I mean, we can totally work to make that happen. But that just doesn't seem like you and your personality. And I was very adamant. I was like, I do like it's important to me to be there for my kids when they get sick. I want them to know I am there 110 percent when they need when they forget their lunch. I want to bring them their lunch. Like when when we do carpools, I want to be involved in that carpool. Like I want to be taking them to dance class. Like I want to be on the PTA. Like I want to do those things that my mom did for me is really important. And as I started to get to know myself better, I recognized like, I do want those things, but, and the big, but was I do want more. 
You know, I do want a life for myself too. You know, I want, I want to have something for myself. I, I want to fly business class and drink champagne. Like I want to have girls weekends away. I want to do things that are just about me. Um, because when I do those things, I come back to myself. I fulfill myself. I know myself better and I show up better for other relationships. And as I started to learn that, and as my husband kind of pushed me and be like, really, really, is this what you want? I realized that the kind of life that I wanted wasn't going to, I wasn't going to be happy or satisfied in one or the other. And all I saw in the corporate world, to be honest, was a lot of people that said you could have one or the other. You could be a stay at home mom. um, And then you could go back to work if you wanted once like the kids got older or you could work and, you know, just figure out a way around that and try to get home a little bit earlier if you could. Um, But you needed to allow that time for your career to progress. Like, right, you couldn't take time off and then go back to it. It'd be too difficult. And I was like, "I, I don't want either of those lives. Like, where is the middle ground? Like, where is this life where I can stay at home and I can be there for my kids and I can create these hours and this lifestyle, but also make a really significant amount of money? Like, there's got to be something out there. I just refuse to take no for an answer. And so I went on a journey to figure out who was doing that. And that's when I started to learn about these online businesses and these online businesses that were allowing you to be impactful and connect with humans and put beautiful content out into the world and also make a lot of money and also have the freedom and flexibility that you needed and wanted for your schedule as a mom that wanted to be at every single zoo field trip, you know? And so as I learned that that was a possibility, that's when I started to light up, you know, and that's when I started to craft and create a lifestyle and a business that lined up with that. And I will tell you, that for me is one of the turning points in my life, you know, not just because I was able to create this lifestyle where I do get to be at home with my kiddos. Um, and also I do get a break from them to do stuff that that is only selfishly fulfilling. Like I get to do both of those things because it makes me a better mom and partner and human. But just this moment in my life where I recognized, like, if there is something else that you want out there, don't give up on it. Like, don't tell yourself all of a sudden, like, no, it's only got to be one of these ways. Like, if, if there's something else out there that you want, like, keep going to find it. Because in this day and age, it is so rare for you not to be able to find something that you really love and want. I feel like we have access to so much right now. We have access to so, so much information, so much education. Like if there is something that you want, you have to keep going to search for it. And for me doing that and finding it was like, I mean, I I had that experience with my husband, right? Like I I didn't think I was going to find a guy that was so up my alley and I was just head over heels. Like, how did I get this freaking lucky? Um, And then I did. And it was like, oh man, this is opening up so many doors of possibility. And then when I found this in my business and when I had people coming to me being like, how did you create that? Show me. I was like, oh yeah, I could totally show you how I did this. And then that ripple affected, right? And that's how like my business started to grow. I heard an interview once that Jennifer Lopez did, and I thought it was so fascinating. She said, you know, she had tried and tried to have children, and she just could not get pregnant. And she said to her dad one day, she said, you know, I guess, and I've kind of thought this all along, that, you know, I I have this wonderful big life, and I've, you know, I'm a singer and an actress, and I, and I, I just, I have this big life, and, and maybe, you know, I don't, I don't get to have both. This is what I was given, and I just need to be appreciative and grateful for that. And her dad said to her, why can't you have both? And quit thinking that way. Think that you are deserving of both. And that really kind of hit her like a ton of bricks, and she started saying that to herself every day. You know, like, I do deserve to be a mom and have this life, and I can do both and do it well. And and it wasn't too long after that that she was naturally pregnant with twins. Uh, isn't that amazing? Yeah, it really is. It, it is really so much to do with your mindset. And and I think, you know, we just have to come from a place of abundance that we deserve it all and we can have it all. And 
Yeah. Yeah. I love that. So what does your work schedule look like? What freedom do you find in not working a traditional nine to five Monday through Friday schedule? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, (laughs) depending on when people are listening to this, right? Like I think schedules uh, pre-COVID, post-COVID may (laughs) vary a lot, but my schedule typically is I don't work on Mondays and Fridays at all. And then I work on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And usually that's from about like nine to three-ish, right? So um, right now my daughter is in preschool. So I will, I'll take her to preschool on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays. And then I hang with her on Mondays and Fridays. And Mondays I typically hang with her and we do kind of normal stuff. We do meal preps and we do errands and we do things around the house. Like like one of my favorite things to do is go to the grocery store with her, um, which most people are like, oh, please do not make me go to the grocery store with my child. And, and I totally get that. But I've been doing this since she was a newborn, right? So we've been going to the store together since she was tiny. And it's just like this really cool thing where we look at the zucchinis and we look at the bell peppers and we talk about what color they are and whether they, where do we think they came from and if they're on sale and the way the numbers look. And it's just this really cool experience that we've always had because it's been important for me to have these Mondays where it's just like, this is normal life. This is just what we do. And then Fridays are always something fun. Like we will go to the zoo or we will go have like a picnic or go to the beach or do something really kind of just fun and spontaneous on Fridays. So for me, that's the way my schedule looks. And and to be completely transparent and honest, there are times where I will take a couple hours on a Saturday and I will go work, but it's usually because I want it. <laughs> it's usually because I'm looking at my husband being like, hey, can I steal a few hours just to myself at a coffee shop? And he's like, 100% yes, you know? And so there will be some times during the weekends where both him and I, we will steal a couple hours for ourselves. And and we also love and love that. And, and I think that that even makes us more attractive to each other that we want just like a few hours to just be us. You know, sometimes it's to go for a run. Sometimes for me, because I love my work, it's usually to go and do a couple hours of work. Um, But I don't always like most of the time I'm not working at night. Most of the time I I'm hanging with my husband, um, (laughs) feeling uh, usually pretty exhausted from taking care of kids, but you know, like winding down and hanging with him, unless I'm working on a really fun project that I'm like in love with, you know, and if I'm like, Oh, super excited and in love with a project, then I, then I, I jump into it at night sometimes. And, And the fun part about it is, is my husband has total insight into my business. And so if it's a project I'm really excited about, I'm usually sharing that with him and either we're kind of like dabbling in it together or we'll like work alongside each other. Like maybe I'll be working on my, you know, something for my podcast and he's working on something else like learning Spanish or something that we feel like is making us kind of like better people. So, but for the most part, I usually just work Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays. I think there's a lot of freedom in knowing how you individually work best. And it's not always going to fall into, you know, the traditional format. If there was one thing that you could tell the Zimmerman audience about creating a business that works best for them individually, what would it be? Yeah. So when people start thinking about businesses, I think that they want to start they want to create or they want to begin to build. I think sometimes it's cart before the horse where people are thinking about the business. Um, And I think that you have to start with your lifestyle and you have to start with understanding what kind of lifestyle do you want? Like what's really important to you? What uh, lights you up and gets you excited? Everything from like, what kind of hours do you want to work? What kind of freedom and flexibility do you want to have to like, what types of things do you want to be doing? Like for me, I'm, I'm, a total introvert and I love to have like one-on-one conversations. So I knew coaching was going to be really good for me. Like podcasting is really good for me because I'm just like sitting in my closet right now. Like it's like you and I are having a cup of coffee chatting, right? And yet it's a scalable piece of content that can go out to, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, but I enjoy it because it's just you and me talking, right? So knowing myself, knowing the kind of lifestyle that I want, knowing the amount of money that I want to make, you know, which is why I started off one-on-one coaching 
Um, and then I built these masterminds, right? And then I built these online courses because I eventually knew I needed to scale my business to be bringing in more money for just for what I wanted, what I want to be able to do with that money um, and give back and impact in, in different ways. So when, when I started with that lifestyle and knowing that those were kind of some, some of my pillars, that allowed me to look at business models that fit that lifestyle. And that's when I could really start to narrow down what I would love and what would allow me to thrive, right? So I always start by, by doing a three-year manifesto. So I envision what I want my life to look like three years from now. And I literally put myself in, in my, in this, like in my bed, usually I, is I start in the morning and I'm like, okay, it's three years from now. You're X years old. And this is the year it is. This is how old your kids are. And you're in your bed. Like, what does your bed feel like? What kind of comforter are you in? What's the first thing you say when you roll over to your husband? And it's like, usually like, I want to roll over. I want him to tell me a dirty joke and make me giggle and blush. And then I want to sneak downstairs and pour him a cup of coffee and um, have, you know, 20 minutes to myself to have like alone time or journal, you know, like, like I'm envisioning what this feels and looks like. And then um, I'm spending time with McKenna and Danny, you know, my other little girl, and we're laughing. We're not rushing to get ready for school. We're not panicking. We're not speeding through the morning. We're, I put on music and we always do a dance first thing that we wake up, you know, like, so when they think about mornings with, with mom, they're not thinking about stressful run, getting out the door. They're remembering the laughter and the music and the dancing. And so I have this whole vision, right. And then it goes into like everything to like, what kind of clients I'm working with, what I'm doing throughout the day, who I'm interviewing for my podcast, like what my bank account number looks like, you know, like I'm going into this, this beautiful vision of what three years looks like. And then I back out what I need to accomplish to make that happen. And, and that usually is how I, I see my business. You know, I I've done that from the very beginning and clearly my three-year manifesto changes every season of my life. You know, once in the very beginning, it was like, okay, I have this coaching business for one-on-one clients. And now when I look at my three-year manifesto, it's very different. You know, there's probably a book in my future. Um, the people I'm interviewing are different because of the kind of clients I've been able to help and work with. You know, like the money in my bank account is very different now in the next three years in my three-year manifesto than it was before. And that then is influencing the kind of business model I am, I am creating, right? That's influencing the fact that I'm not working with so many one-on-one -on -one clients. I'm working in a different different capacity to scale that number. So I think that when you're thinking about that and, and what's going to allow you as an individual to thrive, you really want to envision what the dream looks like in three years. What are you doing? What does it feel like? Like what is, what's the kind of money you want to be making? Because then you can look at your business model and that can reflect your lifestyle. If you want to build a great business or live a good life, you've got to plan for it. Every year, I take a whole month to reevaluate the past 12 months and figure out what worked, what didn't, and how I can create a life I love for the following year. I teach you my exact planning process in my program, Know Your Numbers, annual planning for your best year. If you want a free training to get some tips on planning your best year yet, go to ZimmermanPodcast.com slash Know Your Numbers. That's ZimmermanPodcast.com slash Know Your Numbers. It's so important to just sit and really put yourself in a frame of mind where you're not because dreams are killed with the how and we can't sit here and go well I want this but I mean I don't know how that's going to happen so because then you've killed it um and so taking the time to really you know imagine what this could be like I, I think I said on the last podcast we were doing together I have a program called know your numbers an annual guide to your best year and I take off every November and I do this, but all of module one is so much of what you're saying. It's like, if no one were depending on you and you know, you had a, you had bucket loads of money, how would you spend your days? What would you do? What time would you wake up? Just like you're saying, what kind of bed are you in? 
What does your bathroom look like when you go to brush your teeth? You know, what are you what are you doing in the morning? What are you doing for lunch? What kind of car do you drive? It's just it's a really great way to kind of start that process because we really can manifest what we want. Oh, I, I mean, I mean, the, I mean, there's science behind it, you know, yeah, <laughs> like, I mean, totally. if you're thinking about it, like your brain is going to see the opportunities around it, you know, so it's like, um, it feels very woo woo, and it feels very soft skill. And it is it is one of the main things every successful entrepreneur does is they see and vision, they put it on paper, and they they see it and talk about it and like live it and breathe it until it becomes so clear to them that that's a possibility that the only opportunities that they see now are things that are going to lead up to that vision. So yeah, it's, 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 it's not even a nice to have. It's something I feel like all of us have to do. Absolutely. Oh, I couldn't agree more. I, I love how you were talking about your schedule and everything. I treat the year like a school calendar because I am a mom and, and, but I've done this before I was a mom, but I guess because I went to school <laughs> and then I went to college. So I just was used to going, okay, this is what my fall semester looks like. This is what my Thanksgiving break is going to be. This is what I'm going to do for Christmas break. Here's what my spring semester looks like. And here's what I'm going to do summer break. And everything was different. I might have been working during my summer break and uh, during, you know, Christmas, I might've just been chilling, you know, and watching Netflix. I don't even know if that existed back then, but oh man, <laughs> I'm really not that old. Um, but I think they came on DVDs. I think that's what, what was oh, going yeah, on. yeah, I remember that. You know, but then like maybe my spring semester is lighter, but my fall semester is really heavy. And I do the same thing because I don't want to set myself up to go, this is going to be my schedule. Uh, these are my boundary, my work boundaries or whatever forever. Because it's just not realistic. And so I kind of am able to go, okay, here's the project I'm working on right now. Here's, you know, kind of what, how my fall semester is going to look. Here's how my spring semester is going to look. Last summer, I didn't work at all and I was home with the kids, you know? And so I think, because I think, I think a lot of people have a hard time, you know, sticking to that or like, you know, only working three days a week, you know, and sticking to that or not checking email or taking calls or saying yes to something that's, that's really tempting to them and then being frustrated when they haven't stuck to the boundaries that they that they set for themselves. So how do you, you know, practically commit to your work boundaries? Yeah, oh, that's a good question. And boundaries is such a triggering word, isn't it? I feel like, because oh, I love it. I, I love that. Yeah, word. yeah. It, it, it like brings up so much for people. Like it's it like, does. oh my gosh. Um, so boundaries for me often, um, when I talk about boundaries, there's such a resistance to it. And I'm also not a no person. I, I'm, a, I'm a very much a yes person, um, not in a people pleasing kind of way, because I'm like an introvert. So I, I have I'm I'm okay saying no to like commitments and things like that. But I do have a lot of FOMO. And I do, um, I do, I'm, I'm in a season right now where I love my kids. I love my husband. I love my business, which again, I recognize life comes in seasons. So, you know, check back in with me in a year and see how I'm doing. But I want to say yes to everything. Like I want to say yes to every single thing with my kids, every single thing with my husband, every single thing with my business. And so when, when I think about boundaries, this idea of saying no feels very uncomfortable for me. So Often, instead of boundaries, I will think about the fact that I am operating from a place of values. Like, what are my values? And I need to say yes to those types of things and operate from that place. Um, and then that will allow the other things to fall into the no category, right? Because I have so many good, solid yeses that I don't need all of that other stuff. And so for me, it's it's usually when I when I think about that schedule Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays, it's not uh, I don't think about it as like, these are my hard lines. I only work these days. I think about it as like, how do you want your week to look? What are you most excited about? And I get genuinely pumped to know my Mondays and my Fridays are just me with the kids. Like I get excited about that. So it's less about holding myself to these parameters. It's more about what are you most excited about? And um, those usually come from deep beliefs and deep values and deep passions and loves and dreams. So that's what I get most excited about. And 
working on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday gets me really excited too. Like the idea of sitting in a coffee shop for me and just like working on creating podcast outlines on things that I love or connecting with people like that makes me so excited or building a new sales funnel. That's like a course that's really going to help people start their business. Like that's exciting for me too. Like I love the idea of having that very dedicated present time where I'm not kind of split, you know, trying to play multiple roles. Like I love having that time just to myself. So that it's, it's not like, Oh, you can't tiptoe into other things. It's just, forcing myself to operate from a place of what do you really value? Where are you your best? Like when you get to the end of the day, what are those days that you're your happiest? You know, I've spent so much time evaluating like specific days, like you got to the end of that day, and you were so fulfilled and happy and proud of yourself and in this amazing mental state, what did you do? And normally it's when I'm very present with my kids. I'm very present and laughing with my husband. I am into my work and I feel like I really make a difference in someone's life. You know, I've had a little time to myself. I've recognized my successes more that day than my failures. You know, there are certain things that I've really built my days around that have become these rituals and um, pillars or like boundaries and things that I often operate by, but they're based out of a place of yeses and values. So for me, I really have to lean into that when I think about the structure of my week. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Final question. If you only had the time to do three things for your business each workday, what would those three things be? So in other words, what are your business non-negotiables that at least for you are the keys to forward movement? Mm, I, I love this question. I love that it's making me think too. You know, that's a good question. Um, so the way that I plan my week is I reread that three-year manifesto every Sunday night. So every Sunday night, really? oh my gosh, yeah. And it just lights me up because like you're saying, there's some times where you're just like, it doesn't matter how much you love your job, like you're tired, you know, like you get what's to spend- one, What's one thing that's on there that's kind of scary to say out loud? Um. Well- um, I have a dream of living in New Zealand in a camper van with my family. <laughs> so, no. Kelsey, I'm, I'm telling you, we are cut from the same cloth. <laughs> I had an appointment earlier today with the Airstream people because oh. Brian and I are wanting to buy an Airstream and go travel like the yes. U.S. I mean, I'd love to take it over to New Zealand, but I mean, we just want to like travel for a year. And I literally had an appointment with the, I made an appointment today. Oh, Why are we I, okay. I, it's like the this universe. Is not our last conversation, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you want to be friends, but I'm pretty much just putting it out there it's that it's, it's happening. happening. <laughs> it's happening. Okay. So continue. Yeah. So, so I I mean, it's a great question. So my husband and I, we went traveling for a little while and we did, we went to New Zealand and we lived in a camper van for like two and a half weeks. And it was incredible. It was amazing. The things that happened, um, the state of mind that you get in, it was just amazing. So we often dream of doing that again, right? With our kids as a family, but for a longer term period. And that is in my manifesto. So I don't know that that's going to happen in three years, but it's in there. And so every time when I reread my manifesto on Sunday and and I get, I light up because I get so excited about these ideas and dreams and I've, I've written them down like they're actually happening, then I I pick, you know, probably six to seven things that are on my to-do list that are going to get me closer to that life in that three-year manifesto. And I put them in the, I front load my week with them so that I know that no matter what happens throughout the week, because things are going to happen, life is going to be thrown at you. You know, we're going to have 18 new things by Wednesday that we just have to take care of. But if I know that I am moving the needle and taking care of the things that are going to get me closer to that dream life, that's when I feel like I am doing it. I am owning my life. I'm doing the hard things that are going to get me there. And so for me, my life really is in a place of creating even more kind of passive income online while staying engaged and connected with my audience. And there's a fine line there for me, right? Like you can create online courses, but can you really stay beautifully engaged with these people? 
mobile and high touch. So for me, that's what I've been working on this last year or so. And it's because I read that manifesto. So if I know that I'm waking up in the morning And I'm creating a piece that's going to be so impactful to this online course and I get that done, then I know that that is going to be something that's going to totally push me over the edge to feel really successful. So, so, I mean, and this is a long way to a ham sandwich, but like circling back to your question, (laughs) like, like what are the three things I would say one thing is for sure something that's getting me closer to my manifesto. Like if I get something done that is truly getting me closer to my manifesto, that is one thing that I feel really proud about. The second thing would be doing something that is thought completely selfless and thoughtful to someone else. Um, So like generosity has been a big piece for me this last year. I know that's kind of sounds like, like cliche, but it's not in my nature to naturally be generous the first, like right when I wake up. And I'm okay saying that because I think that I I am generous in a lot of ways. Um, At the end of the year, we're donating a ton of money every single December, but I almost feel like generosity can become an afterthought and I want it to be the first thing I think about. And I just, I I almost just want to like learn to innately check it off my list. So I have tried to incorporate my morning routine, doing something generous, even if it's like for two minutes, if I'm making a connection, if I'm making an introduction, if I'm sending a text to my cousin who lives in the Midwest, you know, like whatever that is, I just want to start and have one generous thing that I do. So one thing towards my manifesto, one generous thing. And then for me, at the end of the day, it's thinking about the things that I'm proud of about myself. And this has been a, a life changing thing for me in the last few years. I always had a gratitude practice, right? Where you're writing down the things you're grateful for. But my n- natural state is actually to be a little bit hard on myself. Like I'm a pusher and in, internally, like I always know I can be doing better. I'm always focusing on how I can grow and personal development. And the only problem with that is that I focus on all the things that I could be doing better instead of focusing on the things that I'm doing really well. And so when I get to the end of the day, I'm always like, I could have done these 19 things better, man, like I'm, I can't believe I, I lost my patience with my kid. And I just don't go to bed feeling good. I don't sleep well, I don't wake up the next morning, a resilient, confident, happy person. And so what I've started doing is I go to bed at the end of the day, and I write down five things that I did that day that I'm really proud of about myself. And it might be like, hey, you woke up on time and didn't hit snooze. Like they may be very small things. Hey, you showered today. Good job. You know, but you, if I can train my brain at the end of the day to say like, Hey, like you are doing a good job, like hang in there, like you'll do better tomorrow, but look at all these things that you did today. Then I'm going to be a better mom. I'm going to be a better wife. I'm happier. And so I I think I would say those are my three things, like something that's going to get me towards my manifesto, something purely out of generosity and celebrating the things that I did that day. That is so good. I love that. Gosh, I just love it. That's such a good answer. Okay. We've had two incredible podcast episodes with you. I mean, I just want, maybe you should just be a permanent guest. I love it. (laughs) Um, Okay. So tell us uh, where we can find you. Yes. Oh my gosh. Um, well, like I said, I'm a bit of an introvert. So the best way to connect with me is really come over to my Instagram profile and say hello in my DMs. Like come pop in there, say, hey, what's up? I heard you on this podcast and just wanted to say hi. Um, that's where you'll really get me um, and my my true self. And plus, uh, if you follow me on Instagram, you'll be able to see uh, the good, the bad, the ugly <laughs> in my Instagram stories. It's very raw and honest. Um, but other than that, you can find me at kelseymurphy.com. My Instagram handle is Kelsey Murphy as well. And then um, I also host a podcast uh, called Whiskey and Work, which uh, we will be having you on as well. I love it. Can't wait. I'm ready. (laughs) That is going to be so fun. Well, thank you again so much for being a guest. And um, yeah, I hope to have you back on soon. Oh, thanks so much for having me. It's always so fun chatting with you.
Ugh, I wish y'all could have seen me when I was talking to Kelsey. I was like a bobblehead, nodding along to everything she was saying. Kelsey gave me such helpful, specific, strategic insight into what it can look like to be a working parent. One of my favorite takeaways from our conversation was that if you look first at your life, what you want, what your boundaries are, what your needs are, then you can find a business that is a good fit for you and gives you the freedom and flexibility that you need. If you want to hear more from Kelsey, make sure to check out our first episode together, Zimmerman Podcast Episode 64. I'll see you back here next week, right here on Zimmerman Podcast.